CataractCoach.com podcast series episode number 20 with Damien Gatinel from France. Now, I first met Damien many years ago, probably 20 years ago, and I've seen him and interact with him on the podium at many different meetings from around the world. And I always learn something from him. He's incredibly bright. Of course, he's an MD, a physician, a surgeon, of course. But he also has two PhDs. He has a background in physics and optics, mathematics. He's incredibly bright. Some of the new trifocal IOL designs came from him and his understanding of this. So he has some great information to share with us. He boils down these very complicated subjects, and I don't have a PhD in in physics or optics, so he boils it down to a very understandable way. So it's clinically relevant for us, surgically appropriate. I think you'll really enjoy it, and you'll learn something that's gonna help you in your clinic today. Check it out. I wanna welcome you to our Cataract Coach Podcast, and today we have Dr. Damien Gatineau. Damien is a true physician scientist. He, of course, is a refractive surgeon, both corneal and lenticular, but in addition, he has a huge expertise in mathematics, optics, physics, and he brings all that together to help give us the next generation of technologies that are going to help our patients in refractive surgery. You've probably already used his designs. He's designed trifocal lenses. He's been involved with a lot of corneal refractive surgery. So, Damien, welcome. Thank you for being on our podcast. Thanks, Udai, for this uh, invitation. I'm very pleased to be here tonight with you. I mean, tonight, my time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, obviously, you work very hard. It's about 10 o'clock at night for you, but you still have time to do this podcast, and we're very thankful. Now, mm-hmm. I've learned from you over the course of 20 years, and I've seen you at meetings across the planet. What was mm-hmm. your path to ophthalmology? Because it's very unusual that you have both two PhDs as well as an MD, and you really combine the science and the medicine together. Yes, I think uh, this is exactly as you said. I wanted to uh, combine some science and being a doctor at the same time. And uh, when I was a younger student, I was attracted by uh, physics, optics. And at the same time, I had, uh, as we say, a vocation to become a doctor, an MD. And I believe that uh, ophthalmology appeared to me as the uh, intersection of a medical specialty and also some uh, some hard uh, science because uh, it's not really difficult to guess that if you do uh, ophthalmology you will have to deal with optics some modeling at least i had this uh, pre uh, pre uh, cognition that i would really be involved in some things like that in fact to be honest with you i thought that ophthalmology was mainly to correct for refractive uh, for refractive errors, I didn't really know about everything else. And uh, this I discovered through my studies, but I kept myself closer to the optics and the visual reparation, I mean, the visual recovery, but on the optical part, not on the retinal side, I would say. Right. So, yeah, your background with mathematics and the physics and the optics obviously it goes very well with cataract refractive surgery, not so much with, let's say, retina surgery, strabismus surgery, oculoplastics. Exactly, exactly. So I, I was confronted with these subspecialties, which were, were quite interesting, but I always got back to, to refractive surgery. And interestingly, my fellowship, the first one I did in France was in the retinal department, but I was lucky enough that I was the only one that seemed to be interested in anterior segment. And my boss at that time said, well, you know, Damien, I feel you have an inclination for this. And guess what? We need someone to deal with anterior segment. So please uh, develop this. And I uh, was very happy to have this opportunity. Oh, fantastic. So you did your training in the sciences and physics, mathematics, optics first before going to medical school. Well, I did a little bit uh, first. And then uh, in parallel, then I stopped because you cannot do everything at the same time. You cannot do... Uh, you cannot be on call. You cannot be uh, at 7 a.m. at the hospital and doing these things. But when I got a little more time, I, I, I resumed with that. I was also lucky to 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 meet with, uh, at that time, uh, Dimitri Azar, um, from, who was at that time associate professor at the um, uh, MIIE hospital, the, the Harvard University. Sure. And uh, he strongly pushed me and, and, and encouraged me to pursue in this direction. And uh, this was the early 2000s, and at that time, you know, there was the introduction of aberrometry, the development of refractive surgery. So 
I, th I thought I was surfing on the right wave at that time, and I was lucky to have this interaction with him and uh, with some other also French colleagues and uh, be pushed by a kind of wave which was pushing towards more and more uh, sophistication in refractive surgery. As you know, in the past, refractive surgery had a kind of uh, so-and-so reputation. People were like uh, flap and zap, you know, it was a <laughs> kind of... Uh, uh, money-making subspecialty, which was a bit like uh, looked at with a little contempt. And I think that over the last decade, it has changed a lot, where now people believe it's quite complicated and you cannot be refractive surgeon on your spare time. You have to uh, go and dive into it if you want to do a good job because of the optics, because of the all the things that brought with biomechanics, uh, you know, all these things, wound healing, inflammatory control, uh, epithelial modeling, all these things sure. uh, went and uh, were really making uh, a refractive surgery a very rich a very rich specialty. And also, of course, the intersection with cataract surgery, which has a strongest uh, refractive dimension since the introduction of uh, astigmatism control, aspheracity control, multifocality, all these things are really also important now. That's a very good point. If you look back 15, even 20 years ago, refractive surgery was just thought of as, let's say, corneal refractive surgery, mostly eczema laser based. But now we understand it's you have to have the full spectrum from mm -hmm. care to refractive surgery, of course, fake IOLs, but also cataract surgery. Now, cataract mm -hmm. surgery is, is, like you said, our most powerful refractive surgery. You can correct mm -hmm. plus 20 hyperopia or minus 40 in myopia. You can correct them both. Yeah. And what happens now is that we have more and more patients that had LASIK in the past. So you had LASIK, the patient had LASIK, then he, he, he must have cataract surgery. And sometimes you have a refractive surprise and then you, you use the previous LASIK to do a touch up. So it's really like uh, interesting that those stories get now very entangled. And uh, if you probably just do cataract, refra cataract refractive surgery, but have no personal experience with corneal, refractive surgery, it may be more difficult to manage those cases than if you do both and can have a, a, a fit into two domains. Yes, so sure. um, I think it's becoming more and more important. And I've noticed as well that the, 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 the increasing number of um, patients who come now with a history of refractive surgery, corneal based refractive surgery, is driving cataract surgeons to understand corneal optics, uh, and this is also, again, uh, making those two worlds more and more um, closer together. Whereas, again, 20 years ago, it was really different. Yeah, it's changed a lot. Even on the IOL side, you know, when we first, if you look back 15 years ago, 20 years ago almost, and you had the new generation at that time of diffractive IOLs, they weren't truly multifocal, they were bifocal. And mm -hmm. we've since mm -hmm. moved to trifocal designs like yours. Tell me why trifocal is so much better than the older bifocal designs. Mm. Well, uh, interestingly, uh, you know, I was pushing, I mean, I, I, I co-developed the first trifocal IOL, which was introduced in uh, Europe um, now in 2010, so 13 years ago, because I was using bifocal, like the restore lens, and my patients were uh, my patients were telling me that they were happy with the reading. And at that time, there was no tablets yet. You know, it was more reading a book. Uh, people had uh, domestic computers, but they were not so much on the internet as they are today. So what they told was that they, um, what they told me was that they had a problem with uh, screen distance, that they had to go very away from it or very close to it. And this was driving attraction to uh, uh, intermediate vision more and more. And uh, my first idea at that time was, why don't we do a distance intermediate instead of a distance near for those patients who manifest a strong desire for uh, spectacular independence for the intermediate vision? It grew up like that. And uh, so the story is long, but uh, I also had uh, some interest in understanding diffractive optics. And uh, I knew how maybe to design something that would be intermediate vision uh, and near vision, but it was a bit fuzzy. And then uh, the story was that there was a company in Belgium who was interested to develop a new IOL, which uh, became the first trifocal because it provided uh, 
intermediate foci between the distant and the near one. And uh, to accomplish this was not so difficult. Of course, it was when we started from scratch. But when you look at it today, I think the, it was not so difficult to design it because it's a natural thing that you deal with uh, kind of uh, harmonics. What I'm saying is that if you have a plus two lens, it could be also a plus four because there are always more than one foci, you know, but it has not so much energy and doing the opposite uh, kind of thinking let you understand that if you have a three addition, you can also find somewhere a 1.5 addition within the same lens, mm -hmm. uh, 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 provided that you do some little adjustment of the steps height and etc. So that's how it, it was on the market. That, that was, I mean, uh, the development then at that time, there was not so much regulation. So CE marking was easier than it would be today. So I, I doubt that today we would do the same uh, success story because of regulation. Um, but at that time, it was easier. So that's, again, timing was good. And there was, you know, if you have something which is successful, usually it requires two things, that uh, there is a demand on the market and the idea is robust enough so you can push and develop it and uh, this was um, a kind of miracle that everything was aligned so this lens could appear. And I'm happy now to, 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 to realize that for uh, Presbyopia correcting IOLs, the trifocal is now the reference and nobody really mentioned bifocals distance near anymore or it's quite not so often that they are really excited by those lenses. Now it's a trifocal lens for... Sure which is first considered or EDOF lenses, but uh, no more uh, bifocals. And, and, and interestingly, the iPad was launched in March 2010, same month that the uh, fine vision lens from Physiol was launched in Europe uh, by, by a strange coincidence. Per perfect timing. <laughs> yes. So how do you make the judgment call now between an EDOF or extended depth of focus lens versus trifocal? So in my own practice, while I tried to embrace the EDO lenses early on, I found that it just without doing significant monovision was not sufficient to give patient satisfaction. Well, I think uh, it's uh, it, it's uh, it's quite difficult to to draw a line. I mean, it's easy to draw a line between uh, um, a uh, strict trifocal and an EDO lens in terms of optics design because a trifocal lens must really induce trifoci for a certain pupil diameter. But what's interesting is that if you take most of the trifocal on the market and analyze them on an optical bench on a, on a small pupil diameter, sure. like two millimeter, then you realize that the small pupil diameter provides a kind of eat off effect on the trifocal lens. And uh, so you have a kind of a plateau curve from distance almost to, to near. Um, whereas on the larger diameter, you can see on the MTF, you know, the modulation transfer curve, like the optical in vitro contrast sensitivity curve, uh, you can see that you see th three foci, uh, which are um, uh, uh, obvious. And, uh, and, and, and therefore, a, a, a head of lens is a, a lens which, uh, um, does not really provide those three foci, but rather under certain condition extend the depth of focus from the distance foci or the distance vision, far vision to the intermediate range. And uh, you know, the, the, the head of, I would say, uh, motivation was that with trifocal lenses, bifocal lenses, there were halo glare described by some sure. patients for good reasons, because if you have more than one foci, uh, you, you you must expect some defocused light, right? But th the idea was that it would be a very good compromise for patient to have the benefit of a kind of extended depth of focus without the hassle of it, which is the halos and glare. But it turns out in my practice that it's difficult to first be very predictive with EDOF lenses because some condition may preclude the real EDOF effect depending on corner asphericity, pupil diameter, and, uh, and and it's a bit obscure how the lens works sometimes. 
Uh, I have a fellow in my department, uh, Benjamin Stern, who's from Israel, is doing a nice research on, on, on analyzing IOLs on an optical bench that we that we acquired. We can analyze diffractive, refractive lenses. And doing this, what we learned, because you can also simulate various corneal shapes, that a need of lens on a bench can behave like a good monofocal lens if the corneal aberration of the of the eye compensates exactly for the spherical aberration which is intended to provide the extended depth of focus so these lenses they are based on some assumptions which are not always matched by the patient's uh, anatomy whereas diffractive lenses have a kind of structure which is a replicate of foci which is more or less robust to the cornea at least it's like a copy paste of uh, the corner sure. of the it's not like an extension of the conoid of the light rays which requires again some modeling assumption and uh, i've seen like wrong reasoning that we and benjamin now understand like oh i have a patient he had lasik oh i'm not sure of the, of the accuracy of my IOL calculation in this context so let's use a, a, a edof lens and it turns out uh, the patient has LASIK in the past. He has a lot of positive spherical aberration. Sure. This positive spherical aberration, uh, in fact, uh, could be per se a nice EDOF uh, inducer. But the surgeon wants to uh, use a EDOF lens to compensate for the uncertainty. Then he uses a negative spherical aberrated lens like the INS, for example. And then what happens, at least on our simulations, is that those two lenses, the cornea, which is very positively aberrated, and the lens, provide the eye with a very strong monofocal kind of uh, uh, refractive properties, which, if you are lucky, will be right on retina, but maybe off the retina. Then you finally get to the, to, to the point that you, you did worse, then if you had maybe used a neutral lens or a sure. slightly positive operating lens. So I think the future will see more and more customization or attempt to customize and to better apprehend those uh, interactions which are tricky. And for this, I believe that manufacturers should give more insights about their uh, lenses, the mechanism that they employ to provide the depths of focus if they don't we will try to do it for them <laughs> <laughs> those, those are all great points i mean so you've got to take into the patient's anatomy like your example with positive spherical collaboration of the cornea a lot of it from mm -hmm. old old lasik that itself gives a wider depth of, of focus for the patient so of, of the big class of these for edof lenses let's say you have a diffractive version like the the technus symphony you have a a beam shaping element like the Alcon Vividi, mm -hmm. you've got a small aperture like the Acufocus IC8, and mm -hmm. maybe you even have Monofocal Plus, which is not quite EDOF, but let's say like a, a Technus Eye Hands. How, mm -hmm. do you, how do you choose this for each patient? Or you, you, you have a lot of options. Exactly. So, um, well, it's a good question. Again, I would choose ra based on some assumptions and a kind of a little instinct that if the patient has, for example, a very negatively aberrated cornea, like he had hyperopic LASIK in the past, I would probably not use the eye ends, which is bringing an, another, another layer, right? So what we realize is that you, you, you mentioned the VVT lens. The VVT lens, as you say, as a kind of a motif, which uh, uh, is a little uh, plateau that you can see at the slit lamp, you know, very close sure. to the center. And interestingly, this lens, I would choose it, for example, for a patient who has an eye which dilates quite significantly in mesopic condition. Why that? Because this lens is, in fact, like a lens where the addition is in the center of the lens. Mm -hmm. So when the pupil dilates, in fact, there is more energy to the distance foci, whereas when the pupil is small, the energy is split a bit not like a diffractive lens this is a debate we could have but let's say with as they call it the stretch of the wavefront which is a bit kind of uh, maybe marketing term because every lens stretches the wavefront anyway uh, but uh, unless it's a planar lens 
But uh, what, what happens is this lens is like, again, the larger the pupil, the less you can see the impact of the central uh, sure. ring. Yes. Whereas on the other hand, if you have a patient who's, uh, for which you expect a eat off on the larger pupil, you would use a maybe an aspheric lens um, to, 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 to get uh, maybe an effect again, uh, which would be maybe uh, more interesting for uh, a less dilating pupil, let's say, or more like a, a constant pupil aperture. So you have a kind of a constant uh, performance of the lens, something like that. Uh, but again, what we do now with the Benjamin is try to analyze uh, the impact of pupil diameter and corneal aspericity. And with those two metrics, we simulate the behavior of all these lenses, and we find that there are couples, like combinations, I would say, of pupil diameter and aspericity, which for a specific lens makes the lens quite good monofocally speaking, like for distance vision, or good for a need of effect. So now you see it becoming it becomes quite more interesting and more difficult. Yeah. Than in the future, you would ask the patient, well, uh, what would you do? What, what do we want? Uh, the patient would say, I want this more than that. So you would translate this in your mind. So the patient is more like willing good distance and maybe a little near, but all the other situation, etc. And from this kind of uh, constraints, you would find candidate lenses that would provide the expected performance, provided that this eye has this pupil dynamics and this asphericity provided that the pre-op pupil dynamics echo the post-op, which is not, all, of course, as simple yeah. as I say it. But that's probably what would make uh, this field a bit more, uh, let's, uh, more, uh, let's say, precise and uh, refined than now where we navigate with uh, wet fingers, you know, like <laughs> you get the wind direction. Uh, yeah. That's, uh, that's a bit what... But it becomes very a very complicated decision tree because now we're taking into account patient's refractive state, pupil size. You may want to take an angle and alpha angle cap. Even mm -hmm. you're looking at the corneal the corneal aspericity. Now you want to pair this with the patient's desires and one of many different option lenses. So you, I agree with you. It's 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 very difficult to figure out what's the best solution. It is, and. It's interesting that I was at ACOS uh, the other uh, weekend, two weeks ago now, and there was, uh, when we showed some results on some lenses, some doctors came, like for example, there was a lens that when the pupil is small, the power is more than when the pupil is large. It was an yes. aspheric lens. Because, you know, they use those complicated spherical aberration, which can be negative here, positive there. So eventually what happened is when you just look at the MTF, you see two peaks, but one peak, can disappear when the pupil constricts, and this peak would not be the, the the distance would be the distance one. So the lens is like it's a 22 lens for a small pupil, but then it becomes a bifocal, uh, 22 and a bit less power. So suddenly a, the distance power appear for a larger pupil. Well, that can be interesting, but what is then the lens power? And there are, there are doctors who told me, oh, with this lens, I had some myopic surprises. Yes, yes, and I, for sure. Yes. And I told them, well, maybe check the pupil diameter. With this lens, if the patient had a small pupil, you would be in the position that, the, the, the I mean, in the situation where the lens has more power than when the pupil dilates. So, um, so and, and again, even when you vary the positive spherical collaboration of the lens, the, the the peak which is uh, at the at the height of the peak would would at least theoretically you know when you do a screw focus you have a peak and you can assume that the highest part of the peak corresponds to the when there is only one peak i, I say to the power of the lens right and sometimes this peak shifts uh, back and forth on a range of um, about one diopter just by changing the corneal recalibration and the pupil diameter. Wow. So th yeah. So that may explain also those little uh, refractive surprises sometimes, or these tendencies that these lens behave like this or like that. But it's very complicated because, of course, you would adjust the constant or the manufacturers would do this for you. But then you may lose one part of the EDOF expected effect 
So it's fascinating at the same time. It's sometimes uh, a bit disconcerting, but uh, that's interesting at least. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, we've all experienced that. Our patients with these EDOF lenses, and we didn't take into account pupil size, and you see post-op the myopic surprise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so now exactly. it becomes more complicated. So even our lens calculations, perhaps we need to include more data. Lens calculations should be more than just axial length, keratometry, and AC depth. Mm -hmm, we should, mm -hmm. well, for these lenses, we should also take into account maybe corneal sphericity as well mm -hmm. as pu pupil size. Yeah, and, and, and you mentioned ACD. I, I'm sure, and it's of course uh, demonstrated since a long time that ACD also controls for depth of focus. So this is another dimension that if you vary it, you may have also significant impact on the achieved depth of focus. Um, and uh, that's uh, quite, again, another um, problem. Um, I mean, problem or opportunity, but uh, this is something we don't control much. So pupil diameter, actual length, uh, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, pupil diameter, corneal sphericity, and ACD may govern a lot of the EDOF, um, I would say, uh, depth of focus uh, effect. And, um, and that's why, you know, and I'm sure you have observed this before I did, like you have patient with monofocal lenses, they do well, like 2020, Jagger 3, yes. and, and you're like, wow. And uh, these lens, these patients should be focused because they may give the clue of uh, why is this effect of surprisingly good uh, depth of focus occurring. And uh, they probably have small pupils, that's, I'm right. sure. Yes, and for sure. You have a pinhole effect. So when you mentioned this pinhole lens, I think this is the easiest yes. way to get good uh, depth of focus, maybe at the expense of uh, retinal illumination a bit, maybe. But if you have aberration, you don't think you can control them. I think this works quite well. I, I've been implanting the camera inlay in the cornea a long time ago, and this was very effective for, for the near. And surprisingly, I would say even well tolerated in the cornea. So I'm both biologically in most patients, as opposed to the reputation, I still see patients with now 13 years wow. of uh, camera inlay implantation, and they, they have inflammation, but they tolerate it well. Uh, so if it's in the IOL plane, this little pinhole effect, it's even better, I think, optically speaking, and uh, it should very be efficient, especially if you have aberration or things that may be uncontrollable, uh, like keratoconus cases, I would recommend that lens, or just in normal corneas to have a pinhole effect, which is probably the most robust way to robust way to, to get, uh, uh, like in photography, uh, an extended depth of uh, field in photography, so in focus in the, in the case of the eye. Yeah. yeah, just have a smaller aperture. But then, as you said, the, it comes at the expense of decreased retinal illumination, particularly at night. Exactly. So I think it's recommended to just use the lens in the non-dominant eye, right? Correct. That's uh -huh. the current recommendations. Now, it seems mm -hmm. to me trifocal lenses are a lot more forgiving in terms of pupil size and corneal issues. Uh, do you find that as well? Yes. Again, especially the, the diffractive uh, lenses uh, are um, kind of uh, immune to this, it, partly at least because diffraction is creating a replication of uh, the combination of the corneal and the lens power, but at different vergencies. So I like the copy-paste image because it gives you an idea that it will work in some ways, regardless of the uh, pupil aperture, more or less. Again, uh, the diffraction is like uh, uh, ventilating light to different foci. And that will happen uh, regardless of the pupil aperture because the first rings usually happens in the one millimeter, one and a half millimeter, and usually the pupil is a bit larger than that. Um, so uh, I think, uh, and, and if the pupil is smaller, it will be like a need of lens, so it will work still. Uh, uh, that's why I think they are robust, but of course, on the other hand, they, they provide more risk of halo and glare. And uh, this is uh, something you have to look at. But, uh, like, usually people are fighting to say this lens is better than that lens, or this concept is better than that concept. 
to me, what is the best predictor of the patient's successful implantation with a trifocal, for example, is the level of cataract pre-op. Because yes. again, and, and of course, the patient motivation and his, and, his, and his visual history. That is, let's take the most difficult case of the minus 2, 45, clear lens patient wanting spectacular independence at all distances. The patient has very good distance corrected vision with his spectacle or contact lens. He has very good near vision. So the brain is tuned. So the image must be sharp at distance and sharp at near. Of course, with correction, but that's not how patients believe. Yeah, they don't think that way. Yeah, yeah they think they, they want this vision at distance and this at near. It's like you go to the restaurant, you're used to this taste and that taste. They don't want a compromise. And uh, if you try to use a trifocal lens for the same retinal image that would make a uh, cataractous patient with a hyperopic history very happy sure. for the same vision, the minus 2, 45 clear lens will be very dissatisfied because everything that will impair the vision that he didn't have before will be for him a deception. And also, what is very important to realize is that the minus two or minus three or myopia provides the best near ever that you cannot match with any multifocal IOL, which is always a compromise and etc. So, uh, if you have a myopic uh, um, habitus for the near, it's very difficult to be satisfied, in my experience, with a mono a diffractive lens. Sorry. Of course, patients can cope with when you explain them thoroughly and they accept that they will need light. It won't be like myopia, but they will be able, able to decipher, as they say, uh, a little uh, card, a smartphone, etc. So that's the most difficult case. On the other hand, a cataracteous patient who had, uh, at 40, he had spectacles to see at near, and especially if he was hyperopic and corrected, so the distance was not very sharp and the near was nothing, and plus he has a cataract, the photon going on the way to the retina are scattered, are lost, absorbed. Sure. So the net amount of distance for side light will be higher, even if it's a trifocal than the, 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 the before. Yeah. yeah than before, because uh, on 100 photon, like 80 were not going on the retina or focused in front or after. So this is a story which will be having a uh, happy ending at the end because the patient will see a net improvement sure. in the vision. So regardless of the IOL you put, of course, IOLs may be better designed in some cases, blah, 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 but you will be happy if he has this uh, uh, near vision distance that he didn't, that he never had before or sure. never had since 20 years, 40 years ago. So that's to me the best indication. And then the exact type of lens of course i would recommend to you to use a fine vision lens <laughs> which is which is the way undergoing fda trial so my american right. colleagues will hopefully i cannot mention the results anything but it's just undergoing fda trial at, at now and i think um, results are have been analyzed now almost for a year and i hope that will be positive enough so the lens can get fda approved yeah that'd be would fantastic we'd love to have more iowa options here in mm -hmm. the usa and so we certainly welcome any of these new designs. But I think we, we made a very, very important point, which is the patients before versus after. That has to be a net improvement. So if you have that 45-year-old who's a minus two myo mm -hmm. and has no cataract, refractive lens exchange, mm -hmm. they're just not going to be as happy. But if you start off with a, a relatively dense cataract or opaque cataract and the patient's a hyper -rope to begin with, the patient will be thrilled. Because the net is an improvement in the quality of vision. Exactly. I think human beings are sensitive to the net change, not to any absolute status or threshold or whatever. And that's where we're explained by when you discuss with patients with like mild cataracts or medium advanced cataract. Well, you say you must see the world uh, in yellow colors. They say no. Uh, and then after the lens removal, they say, oh, you were right. But the brain tunes everything up and they have this kind of vision yeah. which they find well if you improve it they'll be happy if you if you impair it or reduce some dimensions of their vision they won't be as happy and for the same vision again a myop will be dissatisfied the hyperop will uh, praising your merit 
And that's really uh, something you learn with experience. And uh, I think the young who listen to this must learn that again, every patient is different. And what is important is the trajectory you, you put the patient mm -hmm. in, which must go up instead of trying to reach 2020 or this or this Jagger 2 or ju judge your um, patient through his speech, through his history, through your like common sense. And usually you will do the, 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 the good choice and have uh, um, you, you will avoid some uh, some issues with patient who will never be satisfied, even if the surgery is perfect and right. well executed. Yeah. Do you think we'll ever get to accommodating IOLs, truly accommodating IOLs? There, there are a lot of them in trials that are not quite available just yet. Do you think we're, we'll get there five years, 10 years, 15 years from now? I would say first that it's something that fascinates me now that I'm an ophthalmologist and uh, that the, the, the nature has uh, selected a system which is um, something we could never replicate. You know, we can do artificial tissues, uh, artificial... Uh, uh, we have developed a substitution for many organs, or, 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 organs in, the, in the body, right? But this stupid, sorry for the word, lens, <laughs> which is soft and transparent and avascular and uh, just a, a strange mechanism that you need a muscle to loosen zonular fibers so that the lens gets back to its natural shape, which is the near vision, and that when you look at distance, the eye uh, rests, but then the, the zonula stretches and the, the lens gets to its distance vision in a stretch state. All these things are quite strange. And yet, it's and still, we never could until now replicate this uh, because if you do FACO ersatz, you know, like the Jean-Marie Parel tried to do for years, decades in Bascom Palmer. You know, they had everything was almost solved. They could, have, you've seen those fascinating 20 sure. years ago, they could do a, a mini small rexit, aspirate the in monkeys, aspirate the crystalline lens cortex nucleus, fill everything with the a gel, almost get a way to make the eye metropic, but then. PCO would arrive yeah. and ruin the surgery. And, uh, and, and so it's a long introduction to tell you that, again, this is a fascinating me mechanism, which is complex, but could not be replicated. On the other hand, as you know, uh, it lasts for 40 years and probably life expectancy was this kind of uh, range for like not so, not so long ago in the human history. And maybe two two centuries ago, that was a reasonable life expectation. So you would die before you get strong presbyopia. Unfortunately, now we live twice as long as as this, and uh, and I think maybe we will jump over this accommodative IOL to prevention of lens aging. Oh. And I would, if I had, if I would do a prevision, and prevision are very difficult especially when they concern the future, as someone said, funnily. But if you want to make a prediction, it could be that we would first prevent the lens to age sure. from aging, then so keep the softness and the transparency of it using nano technologies or genetics, telomerase, you know, all this anti-aging uh, kind of uh, uh, dynamics. Um, and because if you want to do an accommodative lens, accommodative lens, there are many issues that I don't think can be solved very easily, like even the, the, the power of the system. So you can think of solar battery or using the electricity provided by muscles, but the bio, then the biotolerance would be difficult because the space is very minimal, right? And then you have the optical integration, uh, PCO to control for, uh, so it may just be easier prevent it in the first place. Give some sort of treatment when you turn about forty years old to prevent lens hardening yeah. and opacification. Yeah. Well, I'm sure that one day technology will be strong enough to to replicate what what accommodation is. It's just because when uh, Jules Verne wrote, uh, you know, this uh, story to the moon, 
people would probably say you're crazy. We don't have, we don't even have something that fly in the air, right? Yeah. But it took it took less than a century to make this, uh, or about a century to make this happen. So one day that will, I think, everything that the human being imagine happens at some point. It takes a long route, and some genius people have even forecasted, like you know, Einstein. Uh, he, he predicted the laser that we use now from his complete equations and it took uh, half a century to make the yeah. first prototype of a laser but he predicted that if one day we could master the way that life light can be controlled you could have a very energy energy high energy lens which would be very directional blah 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 he did yeah. not employ the word laser of course he didn't say because this was uh, an acronym developed uh, much later but he described the laser effect so everything that the human uh, kind foresee happens sure. at some point. That can be scary on other aspects, by the way. So this will happen, but will will we see it, you and me? Or will our young colleagues see it? Maybe, but I'm not sure of that. Maybe they will see more a prevention of cataract um, or biomolecular, biomolecular repair of the aging lens. Uh, and that would be probably making pharmaceutical companies happy that if you have a drop, <laughs> which you put every day once you, you reach 30, like a kind of Botox for the lens, yes. they would be... They'd be very happy. <laughs> oh my God, yes. So, yeah, but it, it, even if you look at what we've seen in the last 20, 25 years in ophthalmology, how much we've changed. You don't do surgery like you did from 20 years ago. Incisions are small, we're far more efficient, we're a far safer surgery. Eye well options are, are, are certainly a lot more now. I think it'll keep progressing. And like you said, we went from the Wright brothers, the first airplane, to landing on the moon mm -hmm. in something like 60 or 70 years, less than Not even that. For, like uh, Atlantic was, uh, was crossed uh, in, the in 1928, 6, 9, something like that. And 40 yeah. years later, the on the moon. Apollo, uh, mission uh, landed on the moon so yeah it's it's to me that's this example shows the fastest progress in any domain in technology uh, and probably today we have another very ac a large acceleration in artificial intelligence computer power which is maybe the equivalent of this astronautical uh, um, uh, era uh, one century ago by the way uh, this is maybe now the century of this kind of uh, booming but uh, it goes very fast and 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 in uh, sh short career time uh, as you said we see things like uh, completely revolutionized at least for corneal refractive surgery when i discuss with my patient i say what you will undergo is a bit science fiction if i would explain you in detail that the laser can fire 200,000 spots <laughs> per second uh spots which brevity is such as if a spot would be uh i don't want to say stupid things but uh, uh um uh, last 10 minutes it would be a uh, kind of uh, 20 years between each, each spot this is a ratio between the length of a sphemto laser you know and the time between oh yeah for sure no, yeah. 200 000 seems very short but if you match this with a femto it's 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 like very long so it's probably like uh, 10 minutes 25 years one minute yeah. to the, of course yeah the ratio yeah the ratio between the spot i mean the, the light makes seven times uh, around the earth in one second or goes to the moon by the duration of one laser spot femto spot emission it just travels like 100 microns or 400 microns yeah like almost nothing nothing yeah. so it, it's crazy this brevity and this brevity gives a very high power for very low intensity and provides the miracle of cutting transparent tissue very efficiently and precisely and all this you know it's always funny that it it, it requires like a one ton machine yeah to to, to 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 model and deliver accurately a very very small spot but you need like a ton of instrument just <laughs> at the end to for such to a tiny little thing yeah yes and this is also another threshold to which shows the technological achievements that we did in a very short uh, uh, period of time uh, uh, compared to the human history 
where do you think we're going? What's coming next in keratorefractive refractive surgery? What's coming next in corneal treatments? Well, uh, corneal treatments, maybe artificial corneas, I would say, or could be. Or, yeah. What about on the refractive side? I mean, right now we're doing, you know, Smile or LASIK mm -hmm. or PRK. Are we and, and are we going to do that? Are we going to have presbyopic ablation profiles and be more widely accepted for that? Are we going to have newer devices? What do you think is coming? I think the, the progress in those domains you cited are a bit asymptotic now. Um, LASIK can still progress, but uh, we are really reaching what we can do with current technology. We have a, barometer, a, a topo, a barometry guided instrument. We are maybe what we should maybe now focus on is the way to anticipate or even control wound healing. Especially, mm -hmm. I think the domain where I'm surprised that there are companies, I'm not mentioning them but they are investing a lot of on mild myopia correction which is already so good that i cannot really remember a patient a patient that over the last five years told me i wish my visual quality was better when there's no complication <laughs> i mean what they say what they tell you i wish i didn't have dry eye as much as i have sure uh, you know so trying to make this even more precise to me does not make sense because you, you you play with the background noise and it's not because you will measure this or control for that that you will do a better job as long as you match the treatment with the pupil diameter when you can have flaps for which you control the the the, the, the quality so that they are well centered and you avoid micro folds etc etc the area the domain is before press biopia i think Higher stigmatism and maybe even more hyperopia, which is now limited to plus two, plus four. But we pushed it now to to plus six, plus seven in some specific cases, because we tried to understand what were the limitation and the wound healing is the main problem because of the shape of the treatment. There is like you know this groove in the periphery, which epithelial epithelium grows in, right? Right. So that's an area where if you could control that prevent this or anticipate for it, you would improve hyperopic results, prevent a bit regression and, uh, and, and improve those treatments. Um, so that's an area and there are many hyperopic patients and some of them are despaired and hyperopia is connected to presbyopia a lot. So every benefit, every progress you achieve with hyperopic correction, you can uh, translate it or incorporate it to improve also presbyopic treatments to improve price biopic treatments, I think the first thing would be to improve the semantics because it's a bit like in as soon as you touch press biopia, everyone thinks that they can introduce new concepts out of the blue, like wavefront stretching, uh, press be something, uh, and uh, use concepts which are a bit fuzzy. Or uh, I had this expression the other day, which was not maybe the best one, but magic, like. Uh, yeah. But at the end, it's always trying to put myopia somewhere in the pupil. Yeah, <laughs> and, of course. Uh, yeah, it's it kills the romanticism of, of those techniques. But if you have no myopia somewhere in the pupil, you, there's no chance that a press biopia profile will work. And if you notice well, apart from the company which with which I work, which is Alcon for developing what's called the read algorithm, which is uh, in Europe now introduced on one of our laser, which is like using a kind of addition which is compensated for the distance with some aspherosity correction on the cornea all other approaches are like using spherical aberration or a kind of a shape change but at the end when you look at topographies and aberometry aberometries of all these eyes they have always the same kind of uh, tendency that is most of them have a myopic refraction in the center of the pupil and a reduction of this myopic error towards the, perfect, the edge yeah. of the pupil. And it's sometimes yeah. even impossible from the reference to distinguish between a eye ends implantation, the, uh, just the reference, total eye reference. I mean, you have negative circular aberration usually, which can be from the lens or from the cornea, but it's difficult to say. But it's usually the same kind of titration because optics is optics. And once the lens has gone through the cornea and, and IOL, it has to match certain criteria to provide the reasonable extended depth of focus. And there's no 
10,000 ways to achieve that. And to mm -hmm. achieve this, you need myopia somewhere. So I like to tell the young doctors that instead of believing that there is a magic kind of a wave front, this and that, there's more um, pragmatically uh, an area where the refraction is dominated by a myopic era, surrounded by an area, or the opposite, there is an area of ametropia surrounded by an area where refraction is more myopic. Sure. And this is and this is a definition of spherical collaboration you can use. That is, but it's not as sexy as using other terms. But spherical collaboration is where power changes across the pupil from the right. center to the periphery. It can decrease, it can increase. What is very important is that if it in, if you have like a central, uh, no, I'm sorry, if you work with negative spherical collaboration, you must, and I say must with a big M majuscule, have myopia refraction myopic refraction centrally because negative circular aberration means that the power of your system reduces toward the periphery the problem in europe and you know presbylasic as a kind of a mitigated sure. uh, because in the beginning people say oh i'm going to introduce some prolate asphorization and when they did that what they did not realize is that they made the cornea flatter in the periphery so they had negative circular aberration but a central emetropization and then the reduction of the power, which is hyperopia, and it didn't work. So they say, oh, we should add myopic correction. I mean, we should induce myopia. We should add some plus to get the effect we want. What they didn't realize is that if you need, if you use negative circular aberration, you need myopia in the center. And the negative circular aberration induce the distance vision, not the near. Mm. That's very important. Negative circular aberration induces distance vision because negative circular aberration is less power in the periphery. So if you have emetropia in the center again and less power in the periphery, you have un a useless depth of focus because you have a an eye which is emetrope, and when the pupil dilates, it becomes hyperopic. N no use, right? Whereas if you have a pupil which is centrally dominated by myopia, when the pupil dilates, you have a and reduction have of this. This improves the distance vision instead of being like in blunt monovision to 2200, 20, you'll get uncorrected 2050, 2040, sometimes even 2050. Uh, Is this correct? I'm trying to convert this. Yeah. I'm not this image, but you know what I mean? And, and that's, uh, that's, that's how it works. But again, it's not very sexy to discuss this, and companies try to create different concepts of uh, uh, depths of focus, which can align. But at the end, again, it's always a refractive issue. You, so bottom line, no, no matter what you call it, if you have a corneal ablation profile, mm -hmm. you, to give you the, re, you have to have some myopia in the center of the pupil. Right, or the periphery. Well, what, what can be worked is that you do a uh, central myopization on the non-dominant eye because, uh, and that's where monovision uh, and multifocality are not so opposite as people would think. I would say that multifocality, corneal presbyopic ablations are a way to make monovision less blunt, that is less full. So less, less, less anisometropia. Yeah, it's a small, when I say small, it's in terms of area, it's a, a controlled uh, zone of myopization surrounded by uh, emetropization uh, and that's how it works and uh, sometimes on a dom on the dominant eye what you can do is correct the patient for emetropia in the center and increase the power towards the periphery of the pupil uh, so there is positive circular aberration which can also extend the depth of focus in some ways uh, without too much disturbing the distance vision so are you, uh, uh, you can also employ some degree of monovision to enhance it even more, right? It's To me, it's not so different. Monovision means uh, a certain difference of power between the two eyes. When you have those presbylasic patients that you analyze, when you refract them on the eye, which is better at near, you must correct them with some myopic spectacle sure. power lenses to increase the distance. So if you tell me that the patient had LASIK and uh, a multifocal ablation, but at the end, when you refract the patient, the non-dominant eye requires a minus 125 to get 2020. 
it's a kind of monovision, right? Sure. Yeah. So, but the difference is that with true monovision that I like in my hopes for the reason we discussed, that is, I hardly believe that monovision, uh, multifocality can be very successful in my hopes because their reference vision is very good near and very good distance. So in these eyes, in, in these brands, I should say, the best is to have one eye coping with what the brain likes, that is sharp distance, and the other eye sharp near. If the brain can mix and get those images together, that's okay. But if you provide multifocality in a happen. myopic patient, it's not going to work as much as in a hyperop, which is always in the kind of a fuzzy compromise where, you know, they, they have plus two at distance, but they say, no, no, my vision is fine. And they sometimes swing around the description of their vision. It's very interesting that low hyperop, they don't even want to acknowledge that their distance vision is not good. You know what I mean? <laughs> I always, we see it every week in the clinic. Yeah, same, same. They say, no, my vision is okay. I say, okay, I, good. Well, it's it's enough. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm happy with it. Yeah, but would you describe it as, as sharp? They're this, this like, well, it's okay. I'm, yeah. I'm fine. Uh, so I say, it's blurred, yeah. right? No, it's not blurred. And once one patient told me, you know, yeah. it, it, it was hyperopic plus two, like the one we discussed. I made him zero, plano. And he was like uh, 20, um, he, wa he was like a decimal 810, so uh, 2050 maybe. You have this? 20, sure, 20 sure. sorry, sorry. It was 20, sorry. 20, yeah. 2025 almost uncorrected, but not 2020. And I made him 2015 post up. Yeah. And he complained about the distance. He told me, yeah, it's a bit fuzzy. It's, it's <laughs> what? <laughs> he, says, he, has, he, he has hyperopia on the brain. His brain likes right. hyperopia. No, but. He, he, he said, well, first, what you show me is not far away because it's four or five meters. When they speak about distance vision, hyperops, it's 200 meters. Lots meters. Yes. Yeah. So for a myop, distance starts at one meter, but for a hyperop, it starts at 20 meters. You know, everything closer is that is, is close in their mind. That's, that's, that's very important. And I tell this to the young people to avoid problems. When you speak about distance, far distance vision for a myop, it's four or five meters. But for hyperope, they understand this like a hundred yards, a hundred meters, right? Yeah, you agree with that. And when you show them something on the wall, they say, "Mother, that's close. That's close." <laughs> so, so probably they lose a little distance vision. And I think, um, as you said, their brain is used to hyperopia. Secondly, as one to guy told me, you know, he said before surgery, I didn't see. Now I see fuzzy. I see the blur. That is. They don't see, but they have no perception that their vision is blurred. I think what they interpret the world is like, okay, they have hyperopia, so they, they don't see the details, but they don't see a blur. They see that they don't see, you know what I mean? It's yeah, like for sure. a picture which where you would remove things, but whereas the myopic blur, they hate it because if you overcorrect them, when you have a plus two, you make him a minus 0 0.5. He, he's crazy. He's like, ah, oh, I don't see anything. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's hell. Uh, I'm desperate. Because this now turns for their visual system like in a sh very dense blur. Although they still are like 2023 20, or even 2025 or sometimes even 2020, but they say, ah, oh, it's blurry. And uh, one reason is probably that I think. Um, when they look at two, three hundred yards away, the the light may be dominated by blue or green colors because the sky sure. is blue, and this blue chromatically uh, is more on the retina because of chromatic blur, you know. Sure. Then, then, then maybe white light or a red light. So I don't know, but they manage to be very happy, and probably physiologically speaking, the best refraction for a uh, elite uh, shooter or someone who wants to see very far away is plus one, not zero. That's what I know now. I think a plus one patient has the best distance vision, at least subjectively, they're, they're like, oh, my vision is so good. But you refract plus them. Plus, 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 one. Plus, plus one? Yeah, wow. almost plus one. Maybe, maybe I, I exaggerated a bit, but at least plus 0. 0.5, I swear, is better than zero. Yeah. For everything which is distance vision um, appreciation, I'm sure of that. I always notice this. This way, when I do LASIK in young patients, I target 
if I have an hesitation, I'd rather overcorrect them because I've never seen one complaining to be overcorrected by half a diopter. But I've right. seen many patients that they complain a lot of a little blur, like a half uh, or even a quarter of diopters. Yeah. Sometimes they, they make, make them very unhappy. So going back to your other example of the 45-year-old patient who has clear mm -hmm. lenses and is minus two, what would you offer this patient then? LASIK with some monovision? Yes. Uh, monovision, I test it. Uh, I test it with contact lenses. And uh, it's my first choice in my hopes, uh, monovision. Um, I, I'm not saying that multifocality should be avoided because uh, I have a bias of perception. I would say that most of the unsatisfied patients that come to me for a second opinion were usually myopes who had a multifocal lens and they are not happy with. So I don't see those who are happy because they don't have any reason to come and see me. And I've done some trifocal implantation in myopes, in low myopes, but after a very long discussion uh, and uh, in selected patient. So again, monovision, I think for myopes is good because it matches what their expectation is, at least monocularly. And the only challenge for them is to accept to lose binocularity, which sure. is not easy, uh, but uh, if it works, it will work. And the best is like you, you can test it easily with contact lenses. So there's no way that you will operate on a patient who will complain after it. So it's a debate, you know, I have colleagues, respected colleagues who tell me, I'll never do contact lens trials, because if you do, you will discourage patients. <laughs> I want to discourage yeah, of course. <laughs> that will not be happy because of course. Uh, my is, I have enough patience to live life, to live, uh, to have a successful practice. So I just want to avoid unsatisfied patients. That's what I want. And, no, I, think, uh, I think I think we all do. So to, to, <laughs> to wrap this up, finally, what would you do for your own eyes today? What would I do? What would you choose for yourself? Well, I'm, I'm slightly myopic, so um, I, I fall in the category of the, uh, and I use this to compensate for myopia. So I, I think I would fall in the monovision uh, because I use it already. Uh, well, but if I had cataract surgery, I would be tempted to start with a non dominant eye, maybe start with a trifocal lens of which I know the limitations and the benefits. If I like it, I would do the same dominant. thing. In, yeah. Well, if I don't like it, I would get emetropia or even slight emetropia because what can be also thought of is that myopic patients like myopia. I like myopia. It's nice to, to you know, uh, cut from the distance when you want to focus on something, work on the computer is quite good. But what you could think of is getting a little addition for the distance with the trifocal lens on the non-dominant eye so that when you go and want to pick something there or just do your shopping. You don't have to wear spectacles because you have enough distance to, yeah. to, 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 to navigate wherever you want. And you wouldn't just need spectacles to drive, go to the movie, to have binocular distance. So I would, I would probably try a trifocal on the non-dominant eye, which is left to me, and, uh, and see what happens. And uh, if, if I like it, okay. If I don't, well, I still have the other eye, to, which is dominant to me to... to Leave it, a, leave it a little bit myopic with a monofocal. I could, I could even have a trifocal emetropic and myopic there. I mean, yeah. my brain is ready for that. That's what I'm saying. I would, because I understand those things and I think I would not be dissatisfied because I, I anticipate what would bring the, this kind of scenario. But I, I thought sometimes of lenses which could be for high myopes, completely, uh, I mean, why not? I'm, I'm thinking sometimes like doing a multifocal lens for high myopes that would have a little foci for the distance. So they would be still in their myopic world, but they would be maybe seeing some details in the distance that they don't, of course, with low contrast. But if that's enough for you to see who's, who's getting in your office or in I mean, at home, more, more presumably, they would be spectacle-free at home and they would see who's in the room. They could navigate and get this object. I would like to try this. It's a kind of tricky or uh, unusual concept, but you know, high myopes, we usually hardly make them emetrope postoperatively, right? We just right. 
unless they express a strong desire for uncorrected distance and they are happy to lose the near, usually they want to keep some near. But what what if we had a lens which would make the eye minus three, minus two, or minus two, minus one, but with a little better distance with an addition, a negative addition, to get them with a, a little energy for the distance. That so sounds could, great. A great idea. Well, yeah, they, they could. I don't. I think they would. And you would just tell them you will still need spectacles, but a bit lens for distance. If you look at something, you will see it better than if you don't have this. Uh, the blur will be a bit less, especially if you have bright, contrasted images. So you can see, for example, maybe you can watch TV and read because it's very highly contrasted on those displays. You know, LCD or OLED sure. display. You can read the uh, CNN um, displays uh, because it's not so small and uh, it's high contrasted and mm -hmm. uh, if i would speak like a visual scientist i would rephrase this as there will be enough special high special frequency content uh, conveyed on your retina although not the whole of it so you can see an a from a d a t from a j and read more or less what's written on on cnn although of course to watch a movie to get the full benefit of it you will need spectacles that's sure. a question i always had in my mind and uh maybe one day someone will come with this concept why not <laughs> it, it sounds like a good option for me so I, i'm like you i'm a low myope mm -hmm. and at, after age of 50 being a low myope has become such a blessing right when presbyopia hits exactly exactly but, on the lifespan, the best refraction, if you want to get the best compromise, is probably between minus one and minus two, uh, something that's, like that, right? That's me. <laughs> yeah. I, so you can you, you can sport ex you can exercise the, the workout without anything, sure. social yeah. conversation, go to the restaurant, uh, and what we do now is mostly in the near sphere of one one and a half meter, computer, people, family, things yeah, like so that. Of course. So I guess the, the bottom line for this whole podcast is you really do have to tailor your treatment, whether it's corneal, lenticular, whatever refractive surgery you do, you must tailor it to that specific patient. Exactly. Through, their anat through their anatomy, the pupil size, the corneal aspheracity, but also to what they want, what their brain's used to, what their lifetime refractive error is, and what you can achieve with the before and after improvement. That's right. I think you must tailor your uh, approach. Uh, there's no stereotype that you can apply in ophthalmology to any patient. Every patient is new. Of course, you have categories, and with sure. experience, you, you you can you can put those patients in those categories. But you must have a full spectrum of possibilities, and have no preconceived strategies. Uh, and that's the charm of refractive and cataract surgery with this refractive dimension, I believe. For sure. We have so much still left to learn. So I want to thank you for taking the time to do this podcast. I certainly learned a lot. And I'll put a link below for our viewers so they can see your website and learn more from you. Yes, my website is uh, in French. But there are, I mean, French for everything that people would not really look for. But the content, which is probably more of interest for ophthalmic society, like I will power calculation uh, fundamentals, or like things like uh, some fancy complications like rainbow glare or aspheracity and multifocality, I put it in English to, to, to the benefit of uh, the broad community. So, of course, you can come and visit the website and don't hesitate to send me a message or comment. If you have questions, it helps the, the web page to get better and better. All right. Thank you, my friend. Merci beaucoup. Bonsoir. <laughs> Merci. <laughs> See you soon. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for enjoying that podcast with me. I certainly learned a lot about the physics of optics and the engineering and the Iowa designs and where we're going in the future. Really some great information, and I'm sure you enjoyed it too. Remember, I want to hear your feedback. Go to cataractcoach.com, click on the link to contact me, and tell me, do you prefer this as the video we have on YouTube or on Cataract Coach, or do you prefer it as an audio only where we have it on Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google, etc.? Also, let me know what can we do better. Do you like the format about an hour every time as an interview with a well-known ophthalmologist? Or do you have some other suggestions for us? And also let me know who you would like to have on this podcast in the future. We're going to do a new one every week. So we've got 52 chances a year. I'll see you next week.